having said that, the New Zealand Institute, which was the forerunner to the Royal Society, recorded temperatures in 1868 of 12.7 degrees Celsius, that's their calculation for the average temperature, 55.4 degrees Fahrenheit it was in 1868, and now 140 odd years later, it's still 12.7 degrees Celsius. So recordings made by the Royal Society show no increase in New Zealand's temperature over 140 years. Having said that, yes, world temperatures have risen. They've risen by about 0.7 of a degree Celsius. However, I should explain that I'm not an expert on science. That's not my area of expertise. My colleague Rodney Hyde has studied and lectured in environmental science. But Axe's position is regardless of science, regardless of whether you believe in the hypothesis of man-made global warming or not, we say it makes no sense for New Zealand to impose costs on its own consumers, increase the price of electricity for its own citizens, uh, make it more difficult for its farmers, when no other country in the world has an emissions trading scheme such as ourselves. And, and particularly what I'm referring to is the fact that when we export our product, 85% of it is going to countries that don't have an emissions trading scheme. And Nick Smith would say, well, Europe's got an ETS. Yes, they have but only 20%, one quarter of what we sell, equivalent, is going outside of Europe. Now, interestingly, you might have heard Nick Smith say on television the week, Australia is regulating and they're going to regulate for renewable energy. And they, they're anticipating an increase in electricity prices in Australia of 7%. And we're getting a good deal because our electricity is only going up by 5%. But the point there is that electricity in Australia costs about a half to two thirds of our electricity. So even if Australia was to increase the electricity by 7%, that, that it would still be uh, substantially more cheaper than, than ourselves. So, so in the simple answer to your question, what's happening with NEWA? The government, NEWA people are basically recasting all those numbers and they've made a commitment to have it reviewed by an independent uh, body, which is the Australian uh, Weather Bureau. Uh, last Wednesday, Wayne Mack, the Minister, appeared before our select committee and I asked them to do to extend that peer review beyond just the Australian Weather Bureau, asked them to bring in other independent scientists, so it's actually peer reviewed by more than one other body. We think that the weather records at Newish, their website, are very questionable. When do you think the useless mainstream media will actually pick up the story? Which I think is a major story. Um, uh, that's a very good question. Why aren't the mainstream media... Well, I read about it on the blog. Yep. Well, th this Barry Brule, who's the chairman of the New Zealand Climate Science Coalition, yeah. uh, outlined it in a, in a very well-written article. It appeared on a major blog in the UK, I think, the Quadrant blog. It, it's actually quite a substantial story, which the media haven't picked up on, uh, apart from the fact that NIWA claimed that all the records had been lost, and under the Public <laughs> Records Act they're required to keep the records. Uh, they're having to basically go back and read... When I say the records have been lost, the actual raw temperature data hasn't been lost but the adjustments that they made those and the reasons for making those adjustments. So they had a basically a straight line showing no increase and they did adjustments so they lowered the temperatures in the early 1900s. They increased the temperatures in the late, late 1900s, early 2000s and so it's gone what would otherwise be a straight increase to a, to, a, to a line. And yes, you can justify adjustments. Clearly if you show a weather station from sea level to higher up the mountain, you would expect to adjust it. But equally, if you're adjusting it in one direction in Wellington, you'd expect to adjust it in exactly the same direction at Hokitika if you're moving the weather station up in Hokitika, which they did, but they've done the opposite. So we're questioning that. They um, call that science. Sorry? They call that science. Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess I don't really want to focus a great deal on the science because Axe's position is regardless of whether you believe in global warming or not, whether you believe in a hypothesis, it just doesn't make sense for us to do this to ourselves. You know, we, it's often said that New Zealand's got very big agricultural emissions, and yes, uh, about 48% of our emissions, or emission equivalents, come from agriculture, particularly methane. Well, we've got 3 million dairy cows. We could reduce our emissions by you know, slaughtering our 3 million cows. It wouldn't do much for our income. It wouldn't do much for the food production. But we've got 3 million dairy cows. India has got 300 million cows. <coughs> and we're proposing to tax our farmers, and India certainly isn't. Now, John Key, I mean, I think he started off with Skipper six years ago. I'm sure, you, I'm sure in Parliament he asked some questions that were quite sceptical about yep. the, the global science behind global warming. 
Yep. Um, and he's done a complete turnabout. Now, and Nick Smith seems like a zealot, but what, what's driving these two guys to take us where we're going? The, the answer is I don't know. I, I, I do know that John Key says he's become a, uh, he believes in global warming, the science global warming. Can I just explain that? While I said I don't want to deal on the science, because I'm not a scientist, and that's not my expertise, I did, however, attend a, a climate conference of so-called sceptics. Certainly Lindsay is regarded as probably one of the key guys in this from the sceptical point of view. And those guys will fully acknowledge that we are burning carbon, and there is increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And they fully acknowledge that by the end of the century, carbon dioxide will have at least doubled. So there is no argument from those key, I'm sure there are other sceptics who, who might deny that, but these two key guys fully acknowledge that we, you know, carbon dioxide will double. They'd they point out, of course, that if you did an experiment in a glass house, and if you pump carbon dioxide into a glass house, you double the concentration of CO2, you know, crops will grow faster and they'll grow bigger and they'll grow better. But the point is, what is the impact of doubling the quantity of CO2 in the atmosphere? Now, the United Nations, the UN IPC scientists would say what would otherwise be a one degree increase with positive forcing, with amplification, will become a two to four degree increase and a two to four, you know, two to four degree increase in the world's climate temperature would be catastrophic. Richard Lindzen and Roy Spencer would say, yes, we'll have a doubling of CO2 or at least a doubling of CO2, but what would otherwise be a one degree in temperature, rather than having positive forcing, there'll be negative forcing that would reduce it down, say, to a quarter to a half. The world economy is a... Is a we can spend literally, you know, trillions and trillions of dollars uh, trying to combat this, uh, or combat what is essentially a natural phenomenon. And that's basically you know, natural cycles in the climate. Most people acknowledge that there was a medieval warming period about a thousand years ago, during medieval times, when temperatures were higher than they were today. They were growing grapes in the northern part of the UK, which you can't do today. If you look at the world temperature records in 91 and 92, uh, they dropped about a half a degree. And scientists speculate the reason for that half a degree drop was that was the time of the Mount Pinatubo volcano. Millions and millions of tons of aerosols were put out of the atmosphere, <coughs> and the sun reflected off those aerosols, and those sun rays didn't come down to Earth. And so the Mount Pinatubo earthquake contributed to world temperatures being about half a degree lower. Well, will we'll carpets get carbon credits and synthetic get carbon debits? <laughs> carpets? Yeah. Uh, not, no, uh, except that industrial... I don't know sure if that's a tongue-in-cheek question. I suspect it is. But what I should say is that... <laughs> is that uh, no, no, it's uh, yeah, pretty serious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I'm saying is, is that industrial... Not just as, as electricity generation, electricity generation up for this cost, and the refining of petroleum, which will add to the cost of petrol, you've also got what's called industrial processes, and the, and the um, we've got major manufacturers will be required to account for their carbon emissions, and that's how Fonterra gets caught, and I'd suggest that's how carpet manufacturers will get caught, because Fonterra burns coal and gas to create heat. And if you're a, a carpet manufacturer, you'll, be, you'll certainly be up for a higher cost of, of electricity, but if you're burning coal to fire any boilers, you'll be up for those costs as well. But if the synthetic carpets yeah. made in China and the wool ones made here, the, the poor guy here will be, become uncompetitive. China will be absolutely free to keep manufacturing product. They won't, they don't, they won't be paying for their emissions. Uh, and we, I had a meeting with Fair Farmers Farmers really this, this evening in Palmerston. And they made the point that under the World Trade Organization's rules, it's actually illegal for us to discriminate against Chinese carpet, just simply because we have got a cost on emissions, just because China hasn't got a cost on their emissions, it would be illegal for us to put a tariff on their carpets on that ground. And they made the same point about food. Because Europe is not taxing its farmers, for us not to put a tax on our farmers would not, would, you know, Europe can't rule out imports of our food because we, wouldn't, we don't have an ETS 